Here's the scenario. You've been injured in a serious accident. The doctor says your recovery could take months, maybe even years, yet your insurance company is denying your claim every step of the way. If something like this happens to you, call me, Brian Goldfinger of Goldfinger Personal Injury Law. We have offices in Toronto, London, Peterborough, and now Kitchener-Waterloo. Visit goldfingerlaw.com and get us working for you. Hey, that uh, that was pretty good, I guess. Maybe like if you were there, if you were somebody who paid for the tickets to go to that game, I I am really sorry. That was I've never heard of anything like that happening in a game. But yeah, if you're if you're tuning in, which you are, because you're hearing this, this is the Raptors Reaction Podcast coming to you from myself, Samson Folk, after the Raptors bludgeoned, bludgeoned, sure, the uh, the Pacers by forty points. 131 to 91. This game had everything, dude. So they they walloped them by 40. On the broadcast, we get an all-time Matt and Jack moment with Jack mistakenly referring to Ron Burgundy as Ron Jeremy. Matt Devlin uh, incessantly giggling for... I, I, the duration was like a minute, a minute and a half. And uh, yeah, the a speaker caught fire, an electrical fire, and started burning... Some, I don't know, medium-sized flames, some small-sized flames. But they, obviously, they wondered, like, oh, could this thing come down? This this speaker that obviously weighs, like, an immense amount of weight and could crush thousands of people or something like that? Let's uh, evacuate. So everybody was forced to evacuate the Raptors. They were up by, like, 30 in the second quarter with, like, seven minutes left. They evacuate the building. Firefighters, they get on harnesses and they they get up there and they put out the fire and they make sure the speaker is all looked after and everything. And then the Raptors come out, I believe, an hour and seven minutes later, along with the Pacers. They warm up for a moment. Then they decide, okay, we're going to run it again from the same score. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a really short halftime and we're just going to breeze through the rest of this game. And for the most part, they did. It went according to plan. The Raptors came back in. They actually didn't, like, I, I'm sure there was worries from some, you know, fans that, like, does this create, you know, you remember when the, the power went out at the Super Bowl, right? It went from, like, 28 to 3. Was that that Super Bowl where it was just a huge comeback because the power went out? I don't know, man. Yeah, so there's precedent, let's say, for a huge comeback when the power goes out. And this was, I guess, akin to that, although completely different because there were no fans when they returned. But the Raptors actually built the lead from that moment going forward and largely because of OG, Pascal, Scotty, and then plugging in with them mostly is Precious and Boucher. This game had a little bit for everybody because the Raptors started out this game by attacking the Pacers with OG mismatches. Deep post-entry passes to collapse a defense for plays to be made out to the perimeter or if the Pacers decided to leave their guy, like maybe it's Tyrese Halliburton, Maybe it's O'Shea Brissett. Whoever, on an island with OG, some buckets came out of that, be it either by assist or just by, you know, pure bucketry, putting it in. And, uh, yeah, and then Pascal kind of started, you know, pressing a little bit, getting to his spots on the floor, really, you know, slicing and dicing the Pacers in isolation. When they brought extra help, it went out to the perimeter for three-pointers. I mean, the Raptors, they finished... 15 of 32, which isn't like incredible, but I believe they started 10 of 14 or something close to that. And that was just way too much offense for the Pacers to keep pace with. (laughs) Yeah, great joke, Sam. And uh, we saw like Scotty Barnes as the game was going on and Pascal was becoming a little bit less engaged with scoring the ball because they're up by like 35. You know, what does he care? They're just kind of chilling. He wants to make sure he doesn't get injured or something. And uh, yeah, so Scotty starts taking over more of these possessions. He he's more of the uh, the creator now, and yeah, it was just a piece of cake game. I, I should mention after the break, uh, Fred Van Vliet did not come back in the game. He played 17 minutes, hit a three, kind of just he was he was going through the motions out there. You know, he's operating in a kind of a 
I shouldn't say similar role to Kem Birch because it's not, but it's just it's l- much lower usage than we're used to seeing from him. And he's just kind of taking it easy out there. They're trying to use his spacing, his shooting. And mostly they're relying on Pascal, OG, and Scotty. And then even prior to the the building go up in, going up in flames, maybe there's some correlation here. Precious Sachu was just teeing off from downtown. He finished four or five in this game, but he hit all four before the seven minute mark in the second quarter. Like, if you're the Pacers, that's a lot of Precious Sachu threes to eat in the first what seventeen minutes of the game. It's like it's a bit much. That's hard to contend with. And uh, yeah, he was just pumping them in, dude. A heat pump for sure. And Boucher and, and Precious Achua, they got the shout out on from Zach Lowe and his, I believe it's the 10 things I like and don't like. And I'm glad somebody big wrote about it because as far as I saw, I was like the only person doing the dedicated Chris Boucher pieces about how good he was. And I'm glad that it's like more widespread because he's been so damn good for months. Like, Basically all of December, all of January, all of February, all of March. He's just been damn good, dude. He's like a six man of the year candidate in the sneakiest way possible. And yeah, like he won't win. But if somebody mentions his name, it's like, oh yeah, the Raptors just win all their minutes with him on the floor. And he has some nice box score statistics that we can cite. You know, what is the consideration for him for this award? In this game, I think that, you know, he kind of had like a classically Boucher game, a a classical Boucher game, just 15 points. You know, he cashed in a three, sure, but mostly a guy getting to the glass, two offensive rebounds, eight defensive rebounds, running out on the break, always motion heavy on offense. So if a defense blows a coverage, it's Boucher, man. Boucher is the guy in the back line who will benefit from either the dunker spot movement where somebody else gets, you know, reaps the wards of a busted coverage and they get the ball and they're headed downhill. Whoever has to rotate over, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's Isaiah Jackson, maybe it's, you know, O'Shea Brissett, maybe it's who anybody on the Pacers, even though I don't think Isaiah Jackson played in this game for the record. But anyway, yeah, he didn't. But anyway, like maybe it's O'Shea, maybe it's Buddy Heald, maybe it's Justin Anderson or something like that. And then... Boucher is going to lift up according to that drive and find the open space where he can finish a lay down or a dump off. And it's just like a guy who works so well in the framework of their defense with his length. And it's a guy who works so hard to make it work on offense, even though he isn't shooting the hell out of the ball. He gets some extra possessions. He cuts the rim and he's a huge help for guys who drive like Scotty and, and Pascal. So hell yeah, Chris Boucher, he was awesome. And yeah, precious just, slinging that thing from downtown but mostly this was an exercise in the Raptors dominating in the way that only they are able to league-wide Pascal Scotty OG Boucher Precious these are big dudes and especially relative to skill set for the first three I would say Pascal Scotty and OG considering how big they are and considering the wide range of guard adjacent things that they're asked to do on the court And especially by doing the early work, getting out in transition, pinning smaller guys under the rim, they just throw half-court defenses into difficult positions because the Pacers thought they were good on a lot of possessions. They're like, okay, we're all right. But then you look back behind you, you're just kind of like lollygagging back on defense. Like, all right, we're all good. But Tyrese Halliburton is pinned like under the rim. And you're like, oh, well, how do we scram him out of this situation? And then you look up the floor and you see Pascal Siakam is dribbling right towards you and you say okay well do I stop the ball do I try and you know scram Tyrese out of there back in time is he gonna lift to meet Pascal is he gonna be able to make the pass while we're scramming is there gonna be a cut from the weak side or something like that all this goes into the calculus of how the defense wants to stop these guys and in this game that whatever uh, calculation they had was failing and the Raptors it could be something as easy as Pascal just dribbling a dead straight line from the moment he grabs the rebound to the moment he gets fouled at the rim on the other end. There's very little deviation from the line he's taking. It's just the Pacers are so worried and so you know caught up with trying to stop other guys who are taking deep position or you know filling the lane to the corner. And then even just when the the game actually slows down in the half court, how are the Raptors scoring? And largely it was 
Pascal, Scotty, and OG making things happen. And it's when they shoot well from downtown, how do you guard these guys in in single coverage? Especially when you're the Pacers, who not only do they not have like a super big guy, they played Jalen Smith, who I think had like a pretty nice game for them, which is nice to see because he was buried on the Suns depth chart for so long. But when we see a guy like Jalen Smith or the second biggest guy on the floor is, you know, Justin Anderson, that's, they don't even have the traditional big guy to kind of make the Raptors feel something down low where the Raptors, they're they're smaller than the Raptors and they aren't jumbo in the middle of the lineup. That's, that's the tough part for the Pacers, especially matching up with this Raptors team. And so, yeah, the 40 point, I didn't expect them to lose by 40, but I certainly, I, I was coming in this game like there's just no way the Raptors lose this one. And I was very happy to see the Raptors took it as serious as they needed to. The guys who needed to perform did. And you know what? Nobody on the whole team played more than 31 and a half minutes. That's awesome to see. And Fred played 16 minutes and 59 seconds or something like that. These guys have to be protected. Their health needs to be looked after. And as we get closer to the playoffs, the Raptors are finding a groove to be certain and uh, they're they're making they're making you know waves right now. I'm sure there are some teams you know towards the upper end of the Eastern Conference who are kind of looking at this Raptors team that is more entrenched in its identity, is more weaponized in its identity because of meaningful skill growth from you know certain incumbent players and just the you know Pascal Siakam is back to all NBA level. Whether he gets chosen for that honor or not. Remains to be seen, of course, but he's there. He's in the jumble of guys who should be considered for the third team all NBA. And it's not because Matt Devlin is yelling, you know, Pascal, Pascal NBA on the broadcast or anything like that. But it's because he's he's put in work and he's mu- he's a much better player than he was in 2019-20. He's just flat out much better. He controls the game. Kyle Lowry isn't here anymore. And Kyle Lowry controlled the pace. Like, Kyle Lowry was an all-star level player in 2019-20. Pascal was, you know, the big stats guy. But who was the top dog that year? And who was the, you know, the arbiter of what happened on offense from possession to possession? Tough to say, really. But this year, in the half court, especially since, you know, the second half of the season, since January even, it's, it's not even Fred. It's just Pascal. Pascal is the guy who makes things go in the half court for the Raptors. And he did so, you know, very easily against these Pacers. And I'm I'm excited to see him continue to fine-tune his game as we kind of get closer and closer to the playoffs. He's just been tremendous. And all the guys who punched in around him, Scotty, 19-6 and 7, especially when the rookie of the year race is coming down to, you know, the wire like it is. Mobley just played so solid for so many months and, you know, has had a much better defensive season than Scotty, but Scotty's offensive season is is significantly more impressive than Mobley's. And games like this, where the Raptors play good team defense while Scotty's on the floor and Scotty's also kind of busting out offensively, still, that's these are the things that change what people think. These are the this is what motivates people. And so, hell yes, Scotty, good for you because there's a there's a pay bump with that rookie of the year thing. And it's nice to be recognized as uh, as you know the best in class. And he's he's not even a guy like a Michael Carter Williams, where you're like, okay, you know, he won Rookie of the Year, but he was just best equipped to succeed that year. He won't be the best going forward. Scotty Barnes also gives you that tangible upside where he what he looks like in the future. I don't think anybody could put their finger on it yet. You can say what you'd want, and you can reasonably expect him to get there, but you certainly couldn't predict it because. There, there's so many divergent ways that guys progress and grow. And Scotty has dipped his toes into so many different pools of, of skill development that it's tough to see which ones he chooses, if not all of them. So, yeah, that was cool to see. And OG, them prioritizing him at the start of the game to kind of bludgeon the Pacers, I thought was a really nice touch because, uh, yeah, o- OG deserves touches. He's a hell of a player, so that was awesome to see. He hit his threes. He completely, you know collapse the defense over and over again by working hard to get deep post position. The Raptors just, they beat the hell out of them, man. They did an awesome job. Reggie Evans Award, it's uh, it's Chris Boucher. And this, you know, I, I give it to Chris Boucher a lot, but I what what else am I to do? It's like, 
the the award is handmade for Chris Boucher or the version of Chris Boucher that plays basketball this year. So it's uh he just hustles all game, man. It's he he has the most charges on the team. He said he talked to Kyle Lowry about it. He he rebounds like hell. He's you know, Miles traveled defensively is pretty high up there. He just works, dude. He just puts in the work. Yeah, my my fellow colleague over at Yahoo Sports. <laughs> anyway, uh top quick reaction comment is from DS. Quote, Ron Jeremy, dot dot dot. That's the ball game, end quote. Yeah, that that was funny, dude. And it's it wouldn't be nearly as funny without Maddie D just going ballistic and just giggling his ass off. But that's Maddie D is so good at his job. Matt Devlin, he's a tremendous broadcaster. And and I Jack is also it, Jack is not everybody's cup of tea. He is mine though. I enjoy Jack on the broadcast a lot. And so yeah, I that little tidbit that they had, I thought was just so much fun. So Anyway, I hope that my tidbit was fun for you. Uh, thanks for tuning in, whether you got into it in the morning or at night. Have a blessed day and goodbye.